Hi, this is Uri Litzedek talking Torah and Tzedek. I'm Judd Subar. I'm here with Professor Moshe Halbertal, who is a um, professor at NYU Law School, is on the faculty at Hebrew University, and has been on the faculty of numerous other um, institutions. Uh, Moshe, hi. 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 Shalom. How are, how are you this afternoon? Baruch Hashem. Uh, concerned, um, worried, hmm. thinking about uh, the many people who are in such deep distress and pain. Yeah, there, there's a, a lot to be um, distressed and in pain about. Um, obviously, there are many issues in Israel, in the United States. Um, what, what issues concern you the most? What, what, what causes you the most, the, the most pain? Would you, say? you know, I, it's interesting because I think the, uh, the pandemic is a kind of, um, has, has an x-ray quality. It's like an x-ray, a big x-ray. And you know, the Greek term apocalypse means the, the in Greek it means the unveiling, means the exposing. Uh, and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, there are a few things that comes to mind. One is the, the breakdown of leadership, uh, which is so important in such moments because it calls for, uh, it calls for um, a joint action that is based on trust. And when you don't have a trust like that, uh, you don't generate the joint action that helps you to face such a challenge. So there is a lack of, there is a crisis of leadership. Uh, and also you can see how years of attack on government uh, uh, has weakened the capacity to generate uh, this form of collective action. Uh, you see also the ways in which uh, this pandemic exposes the, the, the disparity, the inequality, uh, uh, difference in access to medicine in the U.S. Also, the, the racial dimension in the ways in which this this horrible pandemic is hurting across racial lines as well. That shows you that there is a disparity in access to healthcare and well-being that cuts through even those elemental aspects of our life. So uh, it exposed a lot. It it exposed alarming aspects and as well a general sense of hubris of, uh, of that causes such unpreparedness. Uh, uh, I mean, if we think about it theologically, right, it's, it's that sense that uh, we think we are so advanced uh, and there is a lack of understanding of our vulnerability, hence also lack of preparedness and thoughtfulness and other things. So all those comes to mind in, in looking at what's happening. Mm -hmm. um, what you're saying calls to my, mind a question that, that I've been uh, thinking about that, that actually um, relates to a, a few of the points that you were talking about. Um, when when, people, when, when uh, citizens of a country or members of a, of a group look to their leaders for leadership, um, one of the things that I think uh, people tend to look for is uh, some sort of example um, as to how to how to deal with other people, how to how, how to view them as others, and how to view them as related to themselves. Um, uh, so I, I'm wondering if you can comment on number one, the question of of, of how we, in, in your mind, based on you know, Jewish thought, based on other thought, how, how we should. Um, interact with the other and how we should view the other right, and right. in the absence of leadership to to give us examples and guidance on that what what are we supposed to do right so uh, you know the, this is such a deep and important question uh, I want to raise two questions that I think are embedded in the Jewish tradition and also uh, speak far beyond the, the, the particular realm of, of Jewish life uh, the first one, I think, essentially is the, the, the language of obligation, which is so important, rather than the language of rights. Uh, and I think um, the language of obligation 
um, I would say, attune you to the other in ways that the language of rights doesn't. Uh, because in rights you say, well, I deserve that, I, 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 I cannot be harmed, I have things that I, I cannot be violated. Uh, but obligation is other-oriented, the duty is towards the other, what we owe to other. And I think that's a, that's a, that's a, a category in our moral imagination and furniture, if we want to say, it has to be restored in a deep way. There is something missing or lacking in the dominance of the language of rights. Uh, so I, I think that idea of, of obligation to others as not only as uh, centers of rights that cannot be violated, but others as, uh, as calling for, in, in to a certain degree, calling for even imposing on us some duties, duties of care. Uh, um, so that's that's very important that in coming from the tradition. The other thing is, and here you know we we think about uh, there's so many dimensions to it, but uh, we think about let's take the case of Maimonides in the last uh, in the last chapter where he deals with issues of obligations to others, which is Daka. And he, he, has a, he has a gradation, famous gradation of, of Malota Tzedaka, the virtues of Tzedaka, eight of them. And, uh, and you see, and one thing that you see, how, how is, how is uh, Tzedaka graded? You can say, well, the more you give, the higher it is, etc. cetera. But, but when you see his grading is actually very different. And it has uh, the axis of, of, uh, of grading has to do with to what degree is the dignity of the receiver being kept. Because uh, poverty is not only an economic condition, it's a condition of humiliation, it's, uh, it's a condition of dependency. And therefore it says the highest form of straka, right, is uh, providing work, giving people uh, ways of getting out of their dependency. Then he says uh, a second, you know, coming afterwards has to do with anonymous giving, uh, etc. Uh, that doesn't create shame. So the whole question of, uh, uh, you know, others, if, if you ask two features, uh, just to start with this, this deep question, one is the other is a source of, 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 of duty of care rather than a center of rights. Uh, and also um, the sensibility to the other in terms of, uh, of, um, of um, seeing vulnerability and need, not only as, a, as an economic condition, but as a, as a mental state, which is so embedded, so embedded in, in our tradition. And, and the care for the dignity of, of, vulner, of the vulnerable. I want to raise another aspect that, that has to do maybe with our, our role as, as teachers, and I'm, everything I'm speaking is about to myself, right? not, not by way of, of preaching, but thinking to myself. Uh, you know, the first, the first bracha in, in the first petition of petition in Shmon Esre, which is the, the center of petition and prayer, is atachonen ladam dat. The first thing we ask for is dat, is knowledge, understanding. And I think uh, that's a very important element of the tradition. And I think we have to think about the, the wrong that comes from thoughtlessness. And, uh, and that the that is, is so important, right? The, the Mishnah says, Lo chasid. An ignoramus person cannot be pious. Piety needs thinking. And by thinking we mean, and maybe a deep Jewish ethos, is uh, a first not accepting the existing order as, 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 as God-giving and, 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 and unchangeable. Right, the idea, you know, because thoughtlessness means just going, drifting with what there is. 
And second, the, the, the humility of learning, just learning from others who thought about the problem. Uh, what can we learn in tackling this issue? Uh, in, in this case, uh, the problem that we are facing. So here we come to the importance of Talmud Torah. Talmud Torah not as an end in itself, as a way of withdrawing from the world, but as a way of coming to the world with thought, with thinking, with depth, with understanding, with learning. Uh, and, um, you know, my father, Alava Shalom, who was a Holocaust survivor, I've learned a lot of things from him, but uh, one thing he said to me, you know, a, a Jew is someone who learns, you know, it's, the, the, the idea that, uh, and uh, I, I think that's another issue that we have to think through uh, seriously. I mean, what is, how much thought, how much learning have we invested in such crucial problems that, that we are facing? Did we examine all the options? That we uh, did, we looked at other sources to, uh, and the humility that comes with being a Talmud, being a student, a Talmud Chacham, is another, uh, uh, maybe another lesson we can draw uh, from from the tradition. Mm. Uh, those are um, thought-provoking thoughts about thought. Um, right. uh, what one um, one question that that occurs to me in light of what you just said has to do with um, what we do when, when we find ourselves uh, challenged to, um, to try to get others to, 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 to think in ways in which we think they should think. But you know, we have our ideas, they have their ideas. Sometimes they're leaders who, as you suggested earlier, might not be leading at all or in ways that we think they should be. What, what do we do to, to to move the ball forward. Right. So I think, I, I think, by the way, part of the crisis we are in here is the, is the crisis of, of conversation because um, democracy is rule, the power of democracy is that it's a rule by argument, right? It's a rule by you, you have gained the privilege of leading because you have convinced enough people that you have the right ideas and you can lead us. Uh, and it's so important, that's what's so attractive about, uh, about democracy, right? You didn't seize power through a, a military uh, revolution or through inheritance just by the power of words, by the, by, by the act of claiming, of making an argument. Now, uh, we have drifted from an argument to manipulation. Uh, uh, the the whole the whole dimension of the capacity to reason to deliberate has been undermined by the fact that uh, that the democratic process is seized by by advertisements companies by uh, the rise of techniques that that come from behavioral psychology and from industry of how to sell things how to manipulate you to etc. Uh, and there is a need to restore. Uh, there is a need to restore the capacity of a conversation, of deliberation. And one way, by the way, of uh, and when I think about Israel, when I think about uh, the U.S., I, I think one way of uh, one way of um, a very a very devious way of of, uh, of moving from argument to manipulation is by um, Claiming that that your uh, predicament, your sorrows, comes from the acts of this and that minority, uh, this and this group, it's a way of uh, of um, of identity formation via negative hostility towards others, that that is deeply manipulative and and wrong. Uh, so, um, so if you ask about how do you convince, you know, how do you, one thing is really restoring in a serious way, restoring the ethos of, of deliberation and argument and uh, breaking the grip of, of, uh, of manipulation. I think, I think part of, as, edu as educators, I, I think part of what we want our students to be and ourselves as well is to be open to arguments and immune from manipulations. 
Uh, and that sort of immunity comes with learning, with, the, with education and learning. And uh, one, one thing that is alarming, and I, I think, um, I think in, in different moments of crisis, rather than look at uh, what we can do and what can be done and where did we err, is the easy way of blaming another, another group that is, uh, is the reason for our problems, which is the ugly side of, of, uh, of the politics of identity in, in this way. Now we are as, as Jews, you know, we know what it is to experience the, with the because we were the others who have been uh, uh, blamed for, who have been scapegoated for this thing. And I always say, you know, as an Israeli, I think we know how to be a minority, but we have yet to learn how to be a majority. And that's a task, that's a task of our generation, the generation that was blessed with independence and sovereignty. You've, you've um, been talking a little bit about identity and how to how to deal with it, um, and particularly a few minutes ago when you were talking about uh, about the Rumbum and um, how he suggests that we deal with people who are at different who who have a different economic identity than us. Um, he he, he right. uh, uh, right. provided suggestions about how to deal with Zakha and so forth. Um, it, it, could you could you contrast? Um, the issue of dealing with people um, with different economic identities, which can hopefully change over time, um, with dealing with people with different, say, um, racial or ethnic identities, that, which can show up in the United States with uh, right. the, uh, obvious um, right. issues of you know, dealing with African the African American right. experience, and in Israel, uh, there. Um, multiple such uh, divides, sure. Jewish, Arab, um, uh, Sephardi, Ashkenazi, and so on and so forth. So, uh, you know, we are, we are vulnerable or prone to being, being, being particular, being, uh, being a, a religion of a particular people. Uh, there is that, that risk, uh, uh, that particular risk that we're facing. But I, I would say the following, and I, I think um, universal obligations are very powerful when they're cast in particular language. I, I want to explain that. Uh, so uh, at least in the Jewish way of looking at things, uh, we start with the, the creation of Adam, right? And Adam is a human the first human, and I think the, the most powerful articulation of that shared humanity comes in the Mishnah in Sanhedrin that asks, why was, why, lama nidra adam yechidi? Why, why was, why did God start uh, humanity with one couple rather than with groups, with families? And, uh, and the Mishnah learns three lessons from it. And it's all cast in a very particular language because it is a particular narrative. In this case, the biblical narrative. Uh, and it says, uh, first to tell you that if someone saves even one person, it is considered as if he saved the whole world. And it's the, it's the ultimate value of, of each person. The second argument, the second thing that the Mishnah says is that that, that uh, people are not going to say, my father is greater than your father. The idea is that the, the sense of we all are coming from a shared human stock, right? There is no, as a, as an, as a deep argument against racism. Um, we are all coming from an, one human couple. Uh, and the third one is, is it's, uh, it's uh, powerful in that Mishnah, it says, to tell you the difference between the, the greatness of God, that when he creates a coin, uh, when, a, when a king creates a coin, all coins look the same, but every human looks different. Uh, every individual looks, so there is an affirmation, there is an affirmation grounded in the tradition, in a very particular language, of three uh, elements in relating to otherness. One is the, the ultimate value of each individual, wherever he or she comes from. The second one is the common 
source of all of us as humans, the shared humanity. And the third one is the uniqueness of each of us as, as human beings. So um, you seeking those voices. I, I think if you ask me uh, um, by way of, 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 uh, of uh, I think the greatest acts of, of generosity and care and solidarity do not come from abstract universal commitment. They come from a universal calling embedded in particular language. Uh, if I take, for example, here's a leader I think I, uh, I have a great respect for and from all leaders that are in, in that are existing, maybe the most remarkable, Angela Merkel, right? You take her as a model. And I think responding to the refugee crisis, she is she was the uh, she was the most outstanding and it's very interesting it didn't come only from abstract cosmopolitan commitment it came from her understanding of the role of germany given the particular history of germany in the 20th century uh, or when you look at um, here we come back to the issue of refugees most of syrian refugees are in jordan in lebanon and syria in turkey now, some of it has to do just with a geographical proximity, but some of it is embedded in the, in, the, in the culture and morality of hospitality that is deeply Islamic. So um, I think the Jewish, if we, if we want to talk about this level of abstraction, um, I, think, um, I think one deep element of, 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 uh, of Jewish, the Jewish world is embedding um, universal commitments in a very particular language, uh, which is which is which I think has to be thought through seriously and important. And um, and that's that's the challenge. I mean, um, that's the challenge of Israel uh, as a as an expression of self determination of a particular people uh, uh, to to exercise that self-determination in ways that are that 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 that, that express a humanistic commitment uh, which is so deeply jewish so you're talking about a, a a jewish moral language and um we began with your referring to the pain that you, you yourself feel in this moment we talked about that a little bit i'm, I'm wondering if you see within the Jewish moral language, just to, to finish up here, both a, um, a recognition of the need to feel pain when that's appropriate, but also uh, the, the possibility of feeling hope when that's appropriate. Right. So I would say the following, uh, and uh, here is uh, here's the concept of repentance. Uh, uh, because, um, and Maimonides says in Chotanit, right? He begins the he begins his conversation. He says when when a when a trouble of that magnitude comes to the community, it's a it's a derech achzarit. It's a cruel fashion that life should go on rather than engaging in self inspection. Uh, and um, and I think there is something deep in in saying the following: something of that magnitude. Uh, with such horrible consequences in so many ways, do not come without some type of human responsibility for it, right? Uh, and um, so there is, I, I think there is an awareness of vulnerability without fatalism, which is the very idea of repentance. We we understand we understand that this this such an event calls for this sort of self-examination, tshuva, in the way that uh, the response in tanit, in fasting, uh, responding to so, uh, and knowing and knowing that that we have the capacities uh, that by by this action of examination, we also assume and affirm our capacities as people to, to deal and to cope with challenges. 
so it's a, it's a mode uh, uh, self self in, self introspection is a is a mode of both on the one hand understanding vulnerability and and uh, challenging hubris and on the other hand is affirming our capacity to action and change and transformation because the very idea of tshuva is that and here we are at the beginning of the month for the lul the very idea of tshuva i think that's the power of tshuva is that the present and the future are not hostage to the past right? the past doesn't fully control our future right i think uh, uh, maybe just by way of liturgically connecting our conversation to the most important moment in Yom Kippur, Kol Nidre, right? We start the Tfila in Kol Nidre and it, the annulment of vows. And I always thought, you know, I'm not the first one to ask this question. How is that became the ultimate moment of, of praying? I mean, it's a, it's a legal act, questionable in terms of its validity as a legal act, you know, annulling all the vows. Uh, but what 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 is the rationale under under underneath it, which is the following? What is a vow? A vow is a way in which I try now to determine what what the future will be through an act of vowing. I say I'm vowing now that I'll do so and so and so and so. I imprison my future through an act of the past and the present. And and the very idea of tshuva means annulment of vows. That, that speaks of the open-endedness of future, right? Uh, uh, and I think, I think this ethos of, uh, uh, of, um, of the way um, the tradition describes response to crisis by way of calling for introspection and, and is both, uh, it's also an expression of hope because it assumes our capacity to um, revive ourselves, the resilience that we have, not to be completely imprisoned in the patterns of the past. And that maybe is the ultimate lesson of Elul and Shuva. Well, that is indeed a, a hopeful thought. Thank you very much. Thank you for that, for that idea and thank you for the discussion. Thank you. Thank you for, for your discussion and for the invitation. Sure.